now that we have spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about data sets and how to make phylogenies and a couple other things related to phylogenies like mapping characters, let's talk about branch support. Now, I want to do a quick reminder, an illustration of what we mean just in general terms when we say branch support. But generally, branch support is a measure of precision in a phylogeny. Now, I also would like to review the term precision just as a reminder. Most of you hopefully already have a good grasp of what it means. Uh, precise just means that you have an exact, it's precise answer. It doesn't mean it's necessarily the correct answer. So for instance, if I was guessing somebody's weight and I said 128 pounds and three ounces, that's a very precise guess. And it might be wrong, right? But it is precise. If on the other hand, I said you're somewhere between uh, 110 and 140 pounds, that might be more accurate, but much less precise. And oftentimes, um, well, ideally we'd have both precision and accuracy when we are dealing with any sort of analysis. But sometimes due to the methodologies or the limitations of the data set, we may not have a very precise answer, but it can still be very accurate. And so if you have to give up one, precision is what you usually give up in return for some higher degree of accuracy. Now, when we're doing branch supports, we're not determining accuracy. Remember, the only real way to determine accuracy is to look at a known phylogeny, such as that from a bacterial colony that we very carefully curated, or from a simulated data set. We can't turn back time, so we don't know exactly if you're accurate. We do all these other things, and hopefully we're, we're getting somewhere there. But precision might be important. And if we have a high degree of precision, and as if we test lots and lots of other things to make sure methodologies are okay, that's, that's good, and it's, it's very, very useful. But again, don't get it confused with accuracy. So what do we mean by branch support? So let me give you an example. This is an example of, an, of a question I used on an exam. Um, and spoiler alert, phylogeny C is the very best phylogeny, so we'll ignore A and B. But let's look at mapping characters onto here, and I'm going to number them. It's probably going to get a little bit crowded. but um, And I'll put little numbers by each of the characters that are variable so we can keep track. There's one, two, three. I'm not going to number the ones that are just all the same because they don't provide any evidence, any data for us. So there's four. Sorry, it's a little hard for me to write sometimes. Five, six and seven. Uh, let's make sure I didn't miss any. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so there are only seven variable characters, and we want to map these onto phylogenies. I already told you this is the best. So we'll do this rather rapidly. It's quick. Um, the first one is an autapomorphy, so we can mark it just in species F. Uh, the second character there is C and E share it, so we just have to mark a single one. In fact, let's put little numbers by these so we don't get them confused. Uh, number three is A and B shared. Everything else is different, so we can separate A and B from everything else right there. Um, the next one is D and F, so we can put character number four. Oops, it's a little large. Character number four right there, and uh, hopefully this is familiar with you to you, maybe even getting easy for you now. C and E is character number five, so we can put that right there. Oh, again, it's a little long, but let's do that. Character number five. Okay, uh, that was C and E share the same thing. And then we have D and F. So we can put character number six right here. And then on the very last one, we have D, E, and F. Now this one is a um, one of two ways we could do it. And either one works for us counting parsimony. But... We could map it as a convergence happening once in the branch leading to E and another time in the branch leading to D. So let's just, for sake of argument, let's do that. Okay, that's a seven there. Uh, you could also mark it as a symplesiomorphy where it was gained in the ancestor of all four of these and then lost leading up to C. And that would explain why E, D, and E, F share it also. But for this sake, let's do this. Now, notice that we have varying levels of support for our different relationships. So... If I was to ask you what support do you have that C, E, D, and F are all a monophyletic group, well, the only support we have is that character right there, a single characteristic number three. 
what support do you have that B is more closely related to C, E, D, and F than A is? And in fact, you really don't have any because we don't have any characters that would mark B as included in this group. If we had another character we could mark there, that would work. So we really don't have any support for that. In fact, I could put B on the outside, and that would be just as likely because I don't have any data supporting B as more closely related to these guys than it is to A. So there's no branch support at all for that branch right there. Whereas for this branch, I've got three different characters that support it. For this branch, I just have two characters. So we have varying levels of branch support. So we're much more confident in these sets of relationships because we have multiple characters that support that. And two of them are synapomorphies. One's a convergence. Uh, we have two synapomorphies here. So we uh, obviously have different confidence levels in many of these uh, branches. Okay. Now, that is just an example of how we might have data that support some parts of the trees better than other parts. So just be aware of that. There are five different branch support methods that we are going to talk about. And in each one, we will give you a, an overview. We are not going to talk about it in a ton of detail. You will have, or you can, uh, some classes you will do this. You'll implement and look at branch support levels um, in uh, mega, the MEGA program. Uh, but again, remember, these are measuring more often. In fact, pretty much all of them are measuring precision and not necessarily accuracy. So we need to take them with a little bit of a grain of salt. Now, before we do that, there's an argument about when you have data, whether you should always combine it, meaning if you've got a gene, like let's say you have an 18S gene and a protein coding gene, do you combine them into one big matrix and then make a tree? Or do you figure out trees and then figure out the consensus tree? This would be kind of like a super tree method. Um, and most of the evidence shows that we should probably always combine data as long as we can. Now, genes are not always going to agree. And in fact, we'll look at some specific examples where genes might actually give us misleading information. In fact, you might already have known one. It's fairly easily remedied if you do a large enough survey and you know enough about genomes. But if you have paralogous copies of genes and you don't recognize it, you might be tracing gene duplication events rather than species relationships, those speciation events. So the answer to this is no, even if there's not some really unusual thing going on to make a gene tree conflict with the species relationships, which can happen. There are a, a number of them. Um, even if you don't have that, you can still have data that is close to being saturated. You could have long branch attraction. You can have a number of things that means one gene is giving you evidence for some relationships while another one is contradicting that. And the idea is if our data sets are large enough, then all of those contradictions, all those uh, errors will kind of even out. They'll almost become like background noise. And the phylogenetic signal in the different genes will all combine to give us the overall best answer. So short answer is no, but that's not really that big of an issue as long as we have enough uh, sampling, enough uh, genetic material to be able to look at those deeper relationships. Okay. In addition, we may have some sampling error, right? So if, if you have a data set that's made up primarily of just one gene, then any bias that is inherent in that gene will be expressed in the analyses that you do for that. So we need to be aware of that. And so sampling error can come from um, a gene bias. It could come from a species if we don't have enough species represented. All of those things can lead us to erroneous or at least um, incorrect results. And so branch support is really looking at this idea of where does our branch support come from. And there are multiple ways to attack this program and uh, this problem and to analyze it and think about it. The first one, maybe the simplest one, is called a Bremer support value. Now, Bremer support values can only be performed in parsimony analyses, and they're very, very simple. Basically, what you do is you look at each branch, and you say, in my best tree overall, we have Melitea and Marpesia as sister groups. So let's find the next best tree that breaks those up. And so we search a whole bunch of trees, and we find the tree with the best score, but that doesn't include these two together. Now, the tree with the over best, overall best score includes them together. But there are going to be some trees that break them apart, and we look for how far away we have to get as far as the tree score before we find a tree that breaks up those relationships. And in this case, it's six. So the, let's say the overall tree length for this was like 254. Okay, so let's just put that in there. Okay. 
Okay, so let's say 254 was our score or our tree length. And we find a tree then that's 248, or sorry, it would be longer, right? So it would be 260, six steps longer. But, and so not as good as the best one overall. It's 260, and it breaks those up. So that means that we have to move things around. There are six characters, maybe, or a combination of, of characters that support that relationship. There are other relationships where we only have to go two away. So we don't like this one as much because the next best tree or two steps away from it breaks those up. So the bigger the Bremer support number, the, the more confident we are in those sets of relationships. So this is 100, maybe at greater than 100. Uh, meaning that we're really confident there's, you have to go 100 steps away to find a tree that breaks up this group, okay? So this, the analysis is asking what's the best tree that doesn't contain each of the clades and then a number uh, above it. And so remember uh, with this one that the higher the number, the stronger the support. Let's put that down here. So with Bremer support values, the higher the number, the stronger the support. And that's generally true for all these support values, although the scale upon which they are is, is limited. So with Bremer support, there's no limitation to the scale. It can be depending on the size of the data set. You could have thousands or technically even tens of thousands of extra steps to mark onto a, a suboptimal tree that would break apart those relationships. So the higher, the better. Now, one of the issues with this is these Bremer support values, although you might be able to compare them within a phylogeny, say this one is you know, uh, half of what that is, so I have half the confidence in that one. Between analyses, we really can't compare them. So if I have analyses A that has maybe only 100 uh, uh, characters in it and analysis B that has 10,000 characters, uh, a Bremer support value is different, means different things across those different analyses. So I can't look at one analysis and say, oh, look, this branch has as much support as a branch in another analysis with a Bremer support value of four. It just doesn't work that way. They're not comparable. And so there's really no objective single way that we can represent these. And so the, the use of Bremer supports is really, really limited. But it's a nice, simple, straightforward idea and was a beginning when people began to work on these branch support values. The next branch support method, number two, is called jackknifing. And jackknifing is really a test for how precise our uh, phylogeny is, how sensitive it is to taxon sampling. So what we do is we remove one of the species. In this case, we remove the bird species, and then we redo the analysis. And if the analysis is not sensitive to that taxon, then you'll have the exact same set of relationships just without the bird branch there. So that bird branch would be removed. You'd still have crocodiles most closely related to mammals. Uh, this is an interesting one. That's a, an error there. But anyway, whatever the phylogeny is supporting, it would be the same except without that branch. But if when you remove a species, things move around, then suddenly those relationships and the ones that have changed are no longer as well supported. And so again, we're not going to get into all the details. It involves multiple iterations. We have to do many different trials, and we have to remove each of the individual species uh, one at a time and then redo the analyses. And many of these branch support measures are fairly um, computationally intense. In fact, sometimes it can take as long or longer than the actual analysis to find the best overall tree. So for jackknifing, just know that we remove one of the species, and so it becomes a test for how precise our answer is and how sensitive our answer is uh, to taxon sampling, to the removal of one group or another's. Now, by far the most common and widespread, oh, by the way, jackknifing you can do with any type of analysis, parsimony, maximum likelihood, neighbor joining Bayesian, you can do jackknifing really with anyone. Bootstrap you can also do with any of the analyses. So bootstrap is also widely applicable and is really the by far the most widely used. You'll see everywhere. In fact, if there are numbers above nodes, there's a really good chance that it is a bootstrap support value. So basically, a bootstrap support is a statistical test for precision or sensitivity within your data set. So if you have a data set with a very wide and lots and lots of samples in here, then it becomes a really good representative of the mean. Bootstrapping takes subsamples of your original data set. So you don't have to generate anything new. You just take subsamples. Now, the key to a bootstrap analysis is it's sampling with replacement, meaning that you look at a character, that first column, 
and all of the other columns, and you randomly sample one, and you make that your first position in a brand new data set. And then you replace the original one back in there so there's potential to sample it again, and then you randomly pick another character, another one, and then you build a data set that's as big as your original. But some of those characters might be sampled two, three, four, five times, while other ones may not be sampled at all. And so the idea is that if you have a branch that is supported by many, many different characters, then you're almost certainly going to get many of those supported in your uh, pseudo-replicate is what they call it, but in your new artificial data set. Whereas if you have a branch that's only supported by one or two characters, it's very likely you'll miss those characters when you're building this new data set via sampling with replacement. So that's key number one. We, do a, we build a data set by doing sampling with replacement. You can do that in milliseconds in a computer, so it's easy to do. But the next step is not so easy, and in that step, we do an analysis to find the very best overall tree and see if with our new data set, do we still get the same phylogeny out of it. So here we're just looking at it is, do I get the same distribution over and over again? And that can tell us how confident we are that we have a good sample uh, and without having to go out and enlarge our sample size. But in the context of a phylogeny, what we're doing is, um, so uh, taking these, making these pseudo-replicates give us our confidence. We are randomly resampling re characters with replacement, make a data set the same size, do an analysis and find the very best topology. Now remember, this is just like this first analysis. So if you're doing a Bayesian analysis, you do another Bayesian analysis. If you're a maximum likelihood analysis, you do another maximum likelihood. So this is computationally intense. And then we repeat it. We do many replicates, usually 1,000. And so it's like doing 1,000 analyses over again each time with a brand new randomly resampled data set. And at the very end, we get out a population of trees. We save the results of every single one of those analyses. And then we summarize them. We make a consensus tree to summarize all those. And if we find a relationship in all of the trees, we get a bootstrap support value of 100. And that's a very good one. So here's an example of bootstrap support values. The highest they can be is 100. That means we found these four species together in every single one of our pseudo-replicates. All of our fake or uh, resample data sets, they still supported the same relationship. So we have a lot of confidence in that relationship. If it's below 50, we collapse it down and make a polytomy. So 52 is very, very weakly supported. 91 and then 99, these are really well supported uh, in the mid-range. So we have different levels of confidence for different branches, so different branch support. And so when you see numbers above it, you'll, you'll always have a figure legend to help you out. But most commonly, these are going to be bootstrap support values, somewhere between 50 and 100. Now, that's a big time investment. Remember I said it can take, especially for large data sets, it can take days and days just to find the very best tree overall. And then you're telling me, oh, now I want to do it again with you know, replicates of subsample data, and I want to do it a 1,000 more times. And so often there are shortcuts that are taken, and we don't do as thorough searches. And the idea is that, OK, we may not be spending as much time on any one individual tree, but overall we'll still have a pretty good outcome and still be able to do it. So sometimes corners are cut because of the large amount of data that it takes to analyze these pseudo-replicates. Okay, so that's bootstrap support value. Um, now, the strengths of this, it's really, really easy to do, and you don't have to get any brand new data. And so people have been doing it, doing it, and sometimes that leads to over-reliance on it and people not really understanding what it is. Remember, like all of these bootstraps, all of these branch support measures, it's really an estimate of precision, not accuracy. Now, hopefully we have both precision and accuracy, but we never know for sure. And experiments on simulated data have showed that it tends to overestimate branch confidence. So they tend to be inflated, particularly as data sets get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally, we are assuming that every single uh, character that we sample is independent, right? We don't have a true random sampling if some characters are uh, dependent on one another, meaning that if we have a mutation in one place, we may get a compensatory mutation in another site. And if we don't recognize that when we're subsampling our data, we get a biased sample in those pseudo-replicates. Okay, so those are all valid knocks against Bootstrap, but it's still very widely used and common in phylogenetic analyses. The last one we're going to talk about was something we already talked about with Bayesian analysis. And it's a little different type of support measure. And this is the posterior probability. Now, on this data set, we have many different uh, measures. So we've got uh, maybe a um, parametric bootstrap, a, a bootstrap support. Don't worry about parametric versus non-parametric. Two numbers above it from 0 to 100. And then below it, we might also have numbers represent a posterior probability between 0 and 1. 
one being the very, very best, that means basically 100%. And uh, we really d we don't get down to zero, but between 50 and 0.5 and one. Now, the posterior probability, one of the nice things about this posterior probability is it's generated as part of the Bayesian analysis. So we don't have to do a completely separate analysis to get branch support values for the Bayesian analysis because as part of it, we've been saving all these trees so we can summarize them at the end. And that summary becomes the posterior probability or how confident we are in different relationships. And so if they have a high uh, up to one, sometimes you'll see it represented as 100, but it's the same scale between 50 and 100 or between 0.5 and 1. And if we're very, very confident in it, and we have very, very high numbers, uh, maybe as high as, as 1.00 or 100. And we have, and basically what that means is in every single one of our trees that we sampled after that burn-in period, remember we let the tree kind of settle down, we, we reassess uh, using the new trees, we get models of evolution, we put them back in, we do this iterative approach over and over again. And as soon as we get to this point where the tree scores after we do these iterations are not getting any better. They're staying the same or pretty much the same generation after generation. And so we save all those trees at that plateau phase, and then we uh, summarize them all together. And if a relationship is found in every single one of those, maybe hundreds of thousands of trees that we've sampled, then we say it's, it's a, a, a posterior probability of one, and that's very, very high. All right? So that is the posterior probability. It's very useful because you don't have to do uh, new analyses. It's generated as part of the Bayesian analysis, but it is only applicable to Bayesian analyses. So the jackknife and the bootstrap you can do for any, any phylogenetic analysis. The Bremer support was only for parsimony analyses, and this posterior probability is really only, it's generated as part of, and it is only part of analysis via a Bayesian inference.